All right, friends, Zig coming in on top. Today on the show, we have Elena Arthur. She is a singer-songwriter from Columbus, Ohio, who is 17 years old. And this is amazing, because I think back to when I was 17, I just met Cody maybe a year or two ago, and we were trying to figure out how to make a band work. I don't, not even then, we wouldn't have been doing uh, aberration stuff, trying to figure out how to how to play play our own songs at Mike Nights. And she's doing that. But she's also recording her own stuff and going around doing her own, her own press, booking her own out-of-town shows, looking for a, a career direction in music. That's insane. It's really, really cool. Um, she has, before we get into it, we're going to plug what she's got coming up. She's got, in September, on the 9th, she's coming out with a new single on all streaming platforms. And then in October, there is a new album coming out. In October, Elena has a new record. Um... But yeah, this is incredible on on two ends because I'm looking at it as a, a music teacher and I work with kids her age. And like that's like the super student you want to have. You want to like show them how to put together some chords so they're out there recording their own records and doing the their own DIY route to self-expression. And the best part about what she's doing is she's leading the way for so many other girls who want to be singer-songwriters or want to be musicians. Just by her doing it, she's showing it's possible. So, in this interview, I do my best not to sound like a like an old person talking to a young person. Yeah, tell me about you. Tell me about your social medias, kid. But uh, there may be some times it might sound like that. I don't think so. I think I'm pretty hip. But you may be the, you may be screaming out of your uh, out of the speakers right now, um, arguing that because a lot of the a lot of times you you know on the show we talk to uh, musicians that are a little bit older, and like, so it was super refreshing to have a whole new perspective. Before we get into it, we're going to listen to one of Elena's songs. Here's You Would Wait. And Arthur, what I find so inspiring isn't isn't the age. It isn't like, oh, here's a kid doing a thing, or a 17-year-old person doing a thing. What I think it's, what I, what I find so inspirational is the dedication to it, because even if you take the same idea and apply it to someone who's 99 and is still actively chasing what they want to do, it's the same type of inspiration. So I don't, th- I don't think the number or the, the youth of someone should define like why we're looking at it, but the drive that this person has. And that's what's infectious. Be it 17, 99, doesn't matter the number. If someone's driven and you get to witness that, and the, the outliers, right, make it more clear. But there is equally as many in the middle. And that drives what's infectious and what's so inspiring. So with that being said, here's uh, my interview with Elena. Dig it? Awesome. Well, how'd you, how'd you come across my, uh, my podcast? So I was kind of just, like, Googling, like, different music-based podcasts that are focusing on, like, local musicians. And I've talked a lot about, like, the Columbus music scene. And so I was like, I'm still in high school. So I've been thinking about where to kind of locate myself after high school. And so I was kind of looking at podcasts in Cincinnati and podcasts in Cleveland. And in doing so, I discovered yours. Cool, cool. What are you thinking? What are you thinking about locating yourself after high school? Are you thinking about going to a a college for music or just kind of Um, locating to a new scene? I'll be attending university for co- or for music. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to go to community college and just do a degree in marketing. Okay. Um, but because that'll be online, I can really do it from anywhere. So right. I've been looking a little bit at the music scene in Ohio City, so I can still be close to home. So Cincinnati and Cleveland. But I've also been looking at moving down to Nashville or potentially like the Orlando area. So there's been a lot to consider for sure. Definitely. I think that well, that speaks miles because like even just looking into podcasts and trying to get a grasp of what what scenes are like around you, that's showing your marketing, <laughs> uh, marketing yeah. like uh, uh, at least uh, uh, start uh, uh, knowledge <laughs> to dive into it. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. I uh, just I want to make sure that anywhere I do locate myself, it's a good environment like city wise and community wise and people wise, but that the music scene is also very strong and very supportive. Um, now before 
I, I hate to do a sales pitch for Cleveland, but before I do, what 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 has like was have you what's Nashville been like? Have you looked into it at all, or what's a um my not Miami uh, Orlando been like? Um, with Orlando, I was looking because before music started to like pick up a little bit, my original plan was to go to UCF. Okay. And so I haven't, that's like probably the one that I haven't researched as much, but with Nashville, it's probably between like Nashville and like Cincinnati and Cleveland right now. Okay. Have you played gigs in each, uh, each city that you've been looking into moving to? Or? Um, I've been trying to play more gigs in, like, I'm playing a gig in Cincinnati coming up, and then I'm also playing a gig in Erie, Pennsylvania coming up. Okay. So hopefully I'll schedule something soon for Cleveland. Nice. Yeah, I haven't made it out to Cincy. Like, my bass player and his other group has, and, like, I've been trying. It's weird. Like, when you book out of town, it's really hard to, like, get the in. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, yeah. But as soon as you do, and as soon as you like go there and you meet somebody, they're like, Oh, it's Elena. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I got a bill you'll be good for. And like yeah. <laughs> it's 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 super interesting like how much once you get one bite, how easy it starts to be. But until then it's impossible because you're just sending emails to like venues and people and Yeah, oh my gosh. Void. There's probably like a million emails a day that I send. But that is so badass because you're doing it at your age. Like when I was your age, I was still like trying to figure out how to put songs together. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I definitely got the one up because I feel like I started on it really early. Like I started performing live when I was 11. Wow. So it's I, I feel lucky that I was able to decide like this is what I want to do like so young because it definitely is like an advantage. Did you uh, is there music in the family? um not really my dad played in a lot of bands in like high school but none were like especially serious or anything so he's been able to teach me about like i guess a little bit about like how to play the instruments that i do but not okay. really on the marketing side and like the booking side right well even you know even if he could it would be completely different because like yeah just how how you how you market your show is way different than before. It'd be like twenty dollars in paper flyers and a day that is yeah. stapled them to the wall. Now it's twenty dollars no. in like internet ads, which is easier. Yeah, I know, definitely. And he was born and raised in North Carolina, and so oh. even looking state yeah. by state and city by city, there's a lot of differences in the music scenes, like everywhere. Have you played in North Carolina? Do you go back for family and like? Um, I haven't. I do. I play a little bit in like Pennsylvania because that's where like the family is relocated to. Okay. But I haven't done any shows in the South yet. Okay. Where at in PA? Erie. Erie. Okay. That makes sense mm -hmm. why you're playing in Erie. All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. Cool. But yeah. Okay. Cool. And like, so now it's not just guitar, right? Yeah. So I play guitar and then recently I've picked up some bass um as well as trying to pick up a little bit of piano okay but did you start on guitar then yeah i okay. started playing guitar when i was seven gotcha wow that's awesome like what were you trying to figure out at seven honestly not much i was not too <laughs> great at it <laughs> i kind of so my school had like a little like guitar club where every elementary schooler got like a cheap like 30 dollar guitar from amazon and we all like were kind of taught by our music teacher and I was talking to my dad about it and I was like this is really cool I like playing guitar and so he got me just like maybe like a $50 guitar right. instead of a $30 guitar and from there like I played that until I started playing live shows when I was 11 so I guess from like 8 to 11 were kind of like my learning years with guitar what was the hardest thing to figure out at first was it how to hold it was it how like how to make melodies I with it i think the hardest thing was for me that i still struggle with a little bit was like strumming patterns because mm -hmm. uh, i mean most pop songs and most songs that i was looking to play when i was like a kid were you know pretty basic like it's like your cga minor for right. pretty much everything but the thing that differentiates <laughs> all those songs is the strumming pattern and so it was kind of hard to kind of like get into the groove of that and learn that every single song has a unique way that you need to play it Okay, so is is the kind of putting two and two together? Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. 
it's interesting because like uh, as a person who teaches guitar to um, younger kids and older people, like everyone has like a, a hurdle and like it's interesting what it is. So and I, that A and B like uh, it, they, well, eventually it plays together really well and you don't think about it. But at first it's a lot to comprehend. Like you're putting this hand doing this and that. And like yeah. uh, even just to hold down the chords, that's where most people kind of give up, you know. I've recently started teaching some guitar lessons to kids, and yeah. one of the things that I've noticed a lot is like a lot of people struggle with just like pressing down hard enough and getting right. the hang of switching between chords. And I feel like that came pretty naturally, and like the strumming was what kind of was difficult. So okay. I feel like everybody, like what you were saying, does have like a very unique like struggle or hurdle to pass now what do you what, what have you done for your um, students to help them kind of like get past holding down like yeah it's gonna hurt but <laughs> like what's been your kind of like work around to get them to actually hold the note down because i noticed that a lot too like either uh, students will like hold it like where their fingers kind of on the fret and they get like this pff, pff, pff sound or like the, the yeah. note doesn't come out and they're like i can't do this and you're like you go over, I, the, you move their finger and hold it down. And like, there it is. And like, but that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> one of the difficulties is like, I feel like the biggest one is if they are pressing down hard enough, then their fingers kind of like, like, uh, like slant almost where they're moving into separate frets or it just doesn't really like sound right. And so what I try and do with my students is I'll call the frets like houses and I'll be like, well, it's COVID. So you got to make sure that your <laughs> before you strum it is in your house <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome okay was it how how old are the kiddos you're working with um i'm working with three kids right now and mm -hmm. they're between the ages of like seven and 12 so okay all right well that makes i don't know for you to teach them that like that's so much more relatable like that's awesome that's really cool yeah that's a good way i to... love doing that <laughs> that's so cool what I started doing was I got a little money counting finger caps or, you know, paper caps. And yeah. I put them on a the student's fingers so they can push down harder. But then it like. Oh, that's so smart. It doesn't, it, it you can't slide. You know, you, you really are kind of yeah. detrimental in the long run. But it works for the, for the class. Wow, that's cool. Like, what's been kind of a takeaway from like showing, uh, showing kids that like, and how to play like this bringing back what you found difficult is it kind of opening uh, new ways to think about it like now it's a uh, my my scales are socially distanced or <laughs> i just i love the the feeling of being naive when it comes to music because to me i don't think there's any better feeling than learning a new instrument because all of like the confusion and all of the struggle and all of the like holy shit i just need to <laughs> like figure this yeah. out is such like a cool feeling to experience. And I love it when kids are like, holy shit, I just need to figure this out. Cause I'm like, I know you can do it. Like I did it too. <laughs> That's at the aha moment. They're like, oh, it clicks. Yeah. Really I cool. just, I, I get so excited when it does click for them because I'm like, yes, like you got this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I relate to that a hundred percent. Like, talking with someone like you at your age and what you're doing is like super inspirational for me. Cause I'm like, that's what I want my students to do. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't work like that. It, it, it's, it, it's all rare, rare people, rare students and rare, rare musicians like you, especially at your age, really commit to the bit because a lot of it is, is 2% is the fun part. You know what I mean? 2% mm -hmm. is playing. The rest of it is like looking up weird podcasts to try to figure stuff out. And like, <laughs> learning theory and trying to like teach children how do i do that like just like all youtube videos <laughs> right right but youtube's such a cool tool for it what have you like uh yeah. what are some that you you've used uh you have used youtube wise um i think one of the coolest things so i recently have picked up a little bit of ukulele okay and I think one of like the coolest things that I will do is there's videos of people on YouTube who will be like, if you know these six ukulele chords, you can play these 80 songs. And <laughs> so watching them do it, I'm yeah. like, all right, now I got at least 80 songs I'll know how to play. That's awesome. Was it, is, was uke the first or was bass the first after guitar? Um, uke was the first after okay. guitar. This... But guitar 
know my first love, and I probably will never bust out my ukulele at a live show. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. The same for me. I had a neighbor who, um, who like their whole family was really into ukuleles before like ukes kind of like where you can get them at Guitar Center. They would like, yeah, like, special order them, and they're like, this one's got special headstocks, and like this is a <laughs> a weird. <laughs> it, w- it was really cool, and like I was like, oh, it's like. I can do this. A C chord is really easy on this. Like, a C chord is one finger? <laughs> right. This is sick. Yeah, I can play any instrument now. That's the confidence builder. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's really interesting with that high string. Like, it, it throws everything off. Like, as far the as, way like... The uh, ukulele is tuned is so right. much different than the it, It's super... And it's no matter what you do, it sounds light, like, and nice, even though... If, playing minor and diminished stuff trying to make it sound yeah (laughs) it all sounds so like airy right right and but it's cool because that's kind of like how the other string instruments become available so what's the Mm -hmm. difference between banjo now well it's kind of easy the chords are all one block type (laughs) thing but the difference is in the picking technique or in like it it's it starts to become that kind of uh disconnect that guitar was for you earlier right is all these different instruments uh, and then did you go to bass from that or did you jump to the yeah, piano? Yeah, and I, I went from guitar to ukulele to piano to bass. And bass, I just started just started messing around on that like a few months ago. So I'm definitely like not anywhere close to being an expert. But again, it's just that feeling of learning a new instrument and like that, like, holy shit, I need to figure this out. And right. I just love it. I definitely relate to that. The Like, now I have this way to express myself in a weird, and, like, it's cool when it's relative. Like, yeah, I can, I can do this because I I can do that with guitar. So I just Mm -hmm. need to figure out the niche things on, on bass or, like, uh, uh, balalaika or bazooki or, like, uh, there's a whole bunch of other rad string instruments that are like all the ones we've been talking about. Yeah. And if you're hooked on that feeling now, you're going to be, like, super into that stuff down the line you're gonna be like oh sweet mandolins dope too like (laughs) but they each got their own little thing that makes them unique and it's really cool just to be able to pick something up and like express with it a little bit or make it say something yeah yeah and that's really all music is is expressing your feelings through a sound and I love that the instruments that I play and especially guitar has been an outlet for that that's awesome when did it like when did it first become like that outlet when was it like when did you have a statement in your mind and were was able to express it through music and have like that emotional integrity and payoff from from doing that i think when i started writing full songs was when it started to become less of just like a hobby and more of like a way that I live and a way that I express myself and an art form and songwriting has always been like the most important thing and the lyrics have always been the most important piece of a song to me and what I hear first and so when I was able to start writing structured songs with a bridge and verses and a chorus it was a way to express myself in a way that was structured and in a way that was able to be enjoyed by other people, not just me. And so the fact that something that I created was enjoyable for other people to listen to too, was like an addicting feeling. Right. So what do you have an outlet for, for practicing, like being creative and writing? Like, is there a, a, cause like it's equally as challenging as like learning scales and chords, but even more so because that's what people are like, well, I don't know if I feel that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I love writing. I love writing poetry. I love writing songs and I also like reading because I've always been like a super big reader. Mm -hmm. And so to expand vocab, like to expand my own vocabulary and the words that I can use in my own songs is so cool and so awesome because it's just like finding out new ways to express what your feelings and making it more specific and more personal and more intimate with every song right no that's beautiful (laughs) so does that mean like you're you're the homie that's like hey i had an arduous day and everyone's like okay i get it you're working on stuff (laughs) (laughs) like 
Um, I try and keep it mostly to the songs, but I have that, like, the grammar bitch in the friend group. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Like, what have you been reading? Like, what are, like, uh, some novels that really kind of sparked your interest in, like, and just changed your, like, kind of outlook on stuff? We Were Liars by E. Lockhart is a super incredible book. I feel like the books that I read for, like, my vocabulary and to improve my songwriting are very different from the books that I read, like, for fun. Because, like, if I were to just, like, sit down and read a book, like, before I go to bed, it's probably, like, a James Patterson novel or, like, Agatha Christie novel. But in terms of books that I've read that I feel, like, improve my writing... Um, I like reading a lot of poetry and I like reading a lot of like older books. I feel like, like what are some poets you've been getting into? Um, I think the first poet that I read that like, I truly was like, Oh my God, this shit is so gas (laughs) was Rupi (laughs) Carr. I read milk and and, like milk and honey in probably like eighth grade. And that's what really got me into poetry. Okay. Yeah, she's definitely got like a, it's a new, it's kind of like a new wave of poetry, her stuff. It's really interesting yeah. and visually, visu- like she, visually expressive. Like, you know what I mean? Because she does the, the, uh, the, um, the line drawings. The line drawings. Thank you. I was like, I don't know how to describe that. I was going to say <laughs> sketch drawings, but it is very liney. Like, it, it doesn't end, it just, it becomes a thing. But she does a, a fantastic job of expressing, like, what is being what you're reading with that and like i don't don't know if it makes me think of a silverstein the guy who did the falling up do you remember those yeah yeah yeah. like um i'm pretty sure he wrote the giving tree too yeah i think you're right (laughs) um but like that was very i don't know if he did all the i don't know if he did all the animation or all the sketches with that but like that just totally put another aspect to what he was saying like it, 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 not too much. Not too much poetry is that. It's very heady, and like you read into the words, and you have that in your mind. But mm-hmm. a vague sketch like that kind of goes super far. But that's cool. Yeah. Who else have you been digging into? Um, poetry wise, I recently read *The Evolution of a Girl*, and that was really good. Um, I've I feel like one of the things that that inspired me to do, and that a lot of the current day and like modern poetry is tapping into femininity and tapping into current day issues in my songs, which isn't something that before like this year, even the past couple months that I really did. Mm. Okay. That's awesome. Like it, it's interesting, like, uh, because like there's certain, like there's certain like songs that are like kind of topical that like expire, you know, that are kind of like let us a few decades down the line. But then mm-hmm. there's some that aren't, and like uh, I, I I don't know what what that is like. But like if you look at like a a Dylan tune or something, he can be singing about a protest, but still that or a Joan Baez or someone like that could be singing about a specific thing, but somehow that carries over. And I think yeah, that it... that's like a that's like an expert form of that of that taking all these new issues and expanding upon the feelings because I don't think the feelings ever differ. For like... Yeah, and I feel like every good song, no matter what the subject line is or no matter what the song is about, every truly good song and every song that is well written taps back to the core of emotion because that is something that can create a timeless song. Right. I wonder what's it like a diving into it, like what as far as like songwriting for you. Who are like the, who are the few like that kind of started because the poetry and all that's interesting, as it is. Was there like a this maybe maybe I should rephrase it this way? Was there a connection between taking the lyrical stuff that you've been enjoying, like reading and poetry, and finding a way to put it to music? Was there like a an individual or someone that showed you oh this is possible, or was it kind of like I had these two interests and eventually like I was like oh I can put them together. Um, I think I kind of figured out on my own that I could put them together. But I think the thing that humped me a lot was seeing older musicians, because I think um, like Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks and 
the Beatles and the Doors were bands that when I got a little bit older, I started listening to more and I just thought it was like the most badass thing ever <laughs> that I could still enjoy the music that my like grandma listened to. And I think that once I kind of discovered that those songs were so amazing and so awesome because it was like poetic and because it was, it tapped into that emotion inspired me to start using that poetry that I always read and those books that I always read growing up into songwriting that was more developed. Okay. That's interesting. Cause like with the Beatles and the doors, like doors, especially as far as poetic, like delivery, like, that's a very like lyrically that's where this that's driven but the beatles doing it in a much more kind of formulaic way for their early career um yeah yeah in but, their early career i don't think i mean i'm not hating on like rubber soul because right. <laughs> like i love their earlier albums but i think towards the beginning they were doing it in a very like this song will do well because it's fun and it's catchy right. and that is an important thing to put into account in songwriting because people are writing music that people will enjoy but once you get to their like later stuff like abbey road and and the white album i think the later stuff was when they kind of started to put words together in a way that was definitely more poetic and definitely tapping into a deeper side i agree with that I, th I think it's interesting because like a lot of artists seem to do that. They seem to start off with like kind of like, oh, look at look at we're cool. We have songs you enjoy. Then like, look at my feelings. Oh, I'm yeah. deep. <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> and those songs are always the ones I like the most. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's it's interesting, like because like that you gotta to get the public uh, uh, attention. It's like you gotta have the that I'm hold hands, you know. Before, yeah. like, uh, she never gives me money, like, is even, like, remotely considered. Or, like, um, happiness is a warm gun compared to, like, uh, uh, ticket the ride, and, like. Yeah, no. Yeah. And I never wanted to be an artist that only put out earworms. And so, for my first single, I, like, took a big chance and released, like, a super depressing song. But I'm glad I did that for both my career and for my artistry. So, like, when did you start? You said you started performing. We'll put a pin in that because I got questions about that. But um, you said your first performance was at 11. What was that? Mm -hmm. Where was that? Um, it was at Katamu Coffee. Okay. And I. it was, like, a couple of days before my 12th birthday. And they used to do open mics. And I saw a lot of local performers who are still doing music um, perform there. And I watched a couple shows when I was younger because I would go in and just get, like, milkshakes with my friends and we would watch music but i realized like oh i play guitar i'm not great at it but some of the people i'm watching aren't that great like i could do that <laughs> it's awesome but that's the accomplishable thing is a big thing being able to see that step like well what? They, they're not I playing love, their f chord right? i love the comfort of open mics because as fun as gigs are and as much as i love playing gigs open mics are just like I feel like the best way to try out new things and to experiment. I, it's such like a no risk kind yeah. of. No, I agree with that a hundred percent. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but like that I've met all my best friends through open mics. Open mics have definitely changed my life. They're I mean, awesome. Like, they are. <laughs> and there, there's a thing like the th the magic that, uh, that coffee shop now holds compared to for you and your set group of friends that would go up there and play is life changing compared to everyone else who walks in and gets their latte and is out. Oh my gosh. So they recently closed, I think like two or three years ago. And when they did, I was like heartbroken. I cried for hours. Oh. <laughs> it was so sad. But I just, I think with Columbus, one of the amazing things about the music scene is that, that coffee shop was so special to me, but there's a million other coffee shops that are so special to other people too. Right. Did you ever play a, was it Atomic Coffee? Um, I haven't, no. Okay, what about a Kerouac Cafe? 
you ever I played that, Mike Knight? I have a big that's starting to set up there. I'm like in work, like I'm talking to their booking right now. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. That's a, are you, so where in Columbus are you? Are you, because that's like the college town, right? Where at Kerouac's at. Um, I'm right outside of the city. I live in okay. Hilliard, which is like a suburb. Oh, okay, okay. Because like, uh, I've played a handful of gigs in Columbus, but it's usually on High Street. Like yeah, I've played yeah. Kerouac a few times. The Space Space Bar. Um, I've and uh, Scarlet and Scarlet and Gray, Scarlet something. <laughs> I can't remember. It's just it's all the same. <laughs> bon Jovi and my way through life. Um, but no, like I, 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 just, I can't. Maybe it's not the same thing. Scarlet and Gray, I think it was. Or Scarlet and Silver. It was like a college bar, and they would have like bands in there. But love um, a college bar. <laughs> say what? Love a good college bar. It's weird. It's a weird venue. Like it's different because like open mics, right? Like when you go there, everyone's kind of like, and at a good open mic night, I should say this. Everyone's there like supporting like whoever's on stage somehow. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think that that makes or breaks the environment that that makes the scene is how the mic nights are handled. Like if it's if it's competitive, no one's gonna really hang around or become friends or like it, ber- it separate and do their own projects and come back and share it. It starts to be like it's, a Yeah. It's difficult when open mics turn into a competition because they're supposed to be more of like a community thing and more of a trial and error kind of space. Right. Do you ever, um, what was the first song you did at that mic night? Was it an original? Was it a um, cover? Um, it was a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, T-Swift? I, for- I think it was, I know it was off the Red album, but I think it was Treacherous? Okay. I was still kind of getting, look like, the hang of strumming at the time because I was, like, I was still pretty fresh out of learning guitar. And so I remember, like, the entire song. Like, I didn't strum at all. I just, like, held out every chord. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a way to do it. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many, like, uh, like, uh, hi- like kind of hipster versions of, like, 80s songs where they do just that instead of yeah. uh, I ran, like, the uh, strum to the, like, eighth note pattern. It's be, like, one chord whole notes, you know? <laughs> and it slows down, and it makes a whole different feel to it. And, like, uh, but that's... That's a beautiful way to start, and Taylor Swift songs have a lot of, one, the melodies are very, like, obtainable. Oh my gosh, she's, like, my, probably one of my favorite songwriters of all time, definitely one of my favorite musicians of all time. Yeah? Was she kind of, like, a one that was, like, oh, I can do this? Yes, I have loved Taylor Swift since I was, like, I think I watched her first music video when I was four or five. <laughs> So I've always just been like, when I found out that she convinced her parents to move to Nashville, like I tried to convince my parents to move to Nashville when I was like 10. <laughs> they wouldn't do so, it? <laughs> no. Ah. So it was, it was really cool because, because I started watching her so young, I feel like I've gotten the chance to kind of evolve with her musically and like, just like growing up. Well, that makes sense. I mean, like, it's now there's someone showing you it's possible. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, um, and she was kind of the first in a lot of ways like that because she, like, wrote her own songs and, like, mm-hmm. and the first to kind of not be a for not, not, not change. You know what I mean? She, like, adapts to, like, whatever's kind of happening in a way that's yeah. uniquely a, a Swiftian, if I may uh, use the correct terminology. <laughs> uh, but, you know what I mean? Like, like if you compare, like, uh, some of the early like love story to like even shake it off or later like I'm trying to think of what's the um calm down the new one uh, uh not the new one oh you need uh, to yeah, calm down. Yeah, yeah you know the kids are listening to the new Taylor Swift I was, but uh, <laughs> I think it's calm down the, I was listening to that one I'm like this is like completely it's it, it hits completely different and in, instrumentation's completely different and yeah. like with the newest albums folklore and evermore right i remember listening to those and being like oh my gosh this is my goal now is to like make an album better than this album (laughs) i was like this is like the peak of music for me (laughs) that's awesome that's and like but having it and seeing it that seeing that it's possible and like seeing having that trajectory with it 
Because I noticed with your recordings, like, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Saturn is very, um, very, like, not just guitar. It's a very um, uh, produced and it's got, like, a, it's, like, it's layered in a way that's not, like, a, it, not just acoustic instrumentation, but in a way that doesn't diminish the acoustic instrumentation that's on it. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. bury it, but it brings it up. And like, it's, it's really well done. And like the, when, when, was, when did that one come out? Um, that one came out after fifth goodbye. I, I'm, oh my gosh. I'm like missing the release states of my own songs, <laughs> but I think it came out in March. Okay. Okay. So it's all, Oh, it's all recent. All right, that makes sense. Um, yeah. All right, yeah, because like, get it's it's different. What was the first one? Because like, the fifth goodbye. Fifth goodbye. That was your first one. Okay, that was very yeah. like, very singer songwritery and like, you have a video to that one too. Yeah, yeah. Fifth goodbye was. I know we said to put a pin in it, but right. let's <laughs> fifth unpin goodbye it. Was, was the was the first song I ever released. It was the first song I ever recorded in like a big kid studio yeah. um what was that what was the big kid studio i was recording with avant music group okay and what did that look with, like was that like you took the song and they're like you know let's put some bass on it or was it like were they kind of like what if you was there like were they kind of directing how to like better it were they just like tracking you and you're like yeah it's cool or like were you directing um, them what did that look like we started off doing skeletons and so it was just me and my guitar and the song and I played the guitar part that I wrote and then from there I talked with the producer Gino and we cleaned up the guitar part so we adjusted the strumming a little bit and we like we were like let's put an A there instead of an A minor or whatever okay. so we cleaned it up a little bit and then we tracked the guitar and I was like I think we should add or just based off of music that like I had heard and that I was enjoying at the time, I was like, I think we should add some bass and I think I want a little bit of this. And so he added that. And then from there, he kind of was able to take a little bit of creative freedom with it. And it was a really incredible process to see these songs that I had spent essentially my whole life writing and that I had only ever heard on me my own voice and my acoustic guitar to be produced into a song that I could hear on a CD or on the radio or on Spotify was so crazy and so eye-opening and so cathartic no it is pretty amazing to see especially when someone else you don't know it's like hey I care that this is like put out you know or like i, I care mm -hmm. that this sounds the best that it can yeah yeah and, and like it's it one you have that camaraderie of like oh you care about my feelings thank you you know what i mean like yeah. and all the producers that i've worked with so far in my career have just been incredible at like taking the vision that i have for my song and turning it into like a real full-fledged piece of art right did you do it to a click did you guys have to click it out with the guitar? Um, doing the click track, I've <laughs> always been like super, it's it's very dependent per song on if I'll okay. do, like record my vocals to a click. I mean, just like even guitar to a click, like the yeah, click, the yeah. click sucks. Like it was, it was the first time I had ever like, obviously, so as a kid, I was in like choir and show choir and all that, but it was the first time I had ever sung to like a metronome when mm. singing like individually okay. which i was i was thankful for my choir and musical theater experience but it was it was like one of those hurdles for sure to kind of jump across it's one of the weirdest things because like it's so like uh and it might be just studio time the red the red lights glowing everything you say everyone's listening to like this is yeah. nerve-wracking now like it might be that but also, like, it's, it's weird that the click, you know, is this common thing that it's just overlooked with most musicians. Like, oh, you just do that. You follow that thing. And when you can't do it, it's like, oh, I'm so awful. I'll never be. You know what I mean? You just start mentally having, like, the biggest breakdown that, you're like, I can't be a good musician because I, I keep missing the one and on this riff here, like, or whatever it is. 
and this with like vocals. My Especially with produ- just vocals, yeah. Yeah, my current producer, Brian Ream, we both are super big perfectionists when it comes to vocals. So if something sounds absolutely phenomenal, but it's just like a half beat away from that click and we have to trap it, it's the most frustrating thing ever. Uh, but it's it's one of those things where like that's what people hear like when they if you're not into music at all the first two things you hear is like the drums and the or the vocals and the drums you yeah. know what i mean like so being a perfectionist at it i think it's very uh, appropriate thing to worry about because like as a singer songwriter it's kind of like the the thing that's uniquely yours no matter what it's going to be your voice and mm-hmm. like definitely the thing to worry about <laughs> yeah yeah I I think in everyday life, I'm definitely a perfectionist. Yeah. And I think even more so oh, no. in music I am. How is it, how is it so, manifest in, in everyday life? Like When I think one of the biggest things is that I'm such a perfectionist every single day with schoolwork and like I won't submit an assignment unless it is like absolutely how I want this assignment to look Mm. and to be and with working out I want to like do that every single day at the same exact time and I think music is I'm definitely a perfectionist with that too in the studio but I think songwriting is almost an escape from the perfectionism because the words like flow out of me and the lyrics flow out of me so easily that it's almost like something else kind of takes over and I don't have to worry about the anxiety or the perfectionism. And I can just kind of write what I feel like I need to write at the moment and anything imperfect, like imperfect, that's an imperfection in in, that I would have seen is bypassed by, I actually kind of like that in this song or whatever. And I think most people would assume that songwriting would be, another thing that I would be like, this needs to be absolutely this way and absolutely perfect. But songwriting is almost the only thing that I'm not like that with. Interesting. Do you, so like with a, have you always been like a, the structurally comfortable, like growing up? Has that been a um, thing? I used to write songs that were just like, oh my gosh, it probably took me until I was like 11 or 12 to be able to write songs that had like a specific like verse and bridge and chorus. And it took me a while to even like figure out what those were. I just meant like kind of like even just throughout the day, like, oh, I go to school here. I do this there. Like, do you find comfort with like structure and stuff like that? Um, I, I don't know. I feel like, when everything is completely structured, there's almost like a sense of like boredom or like I'm not living freely enough or I'm not, I I, like, I talk a lot about in the new album about the feeling of like wasting youth or wasting time. And so I think I like to have a certain amount of structure, but there comes a time when I just need to be able to like do whatever the fuck I want that day. And yeah. Play car in the middle of nowhere, or whatever I'm, I'm just feeling. So, okay. So it's not necessarily like a comfort in structure, but it's like a comfort in like ye- maximum like usage of this space or this time. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I totally relate to that. Like uh, existential dread that <laughs> you're only going to yeah. be, this old for this year at this time and like how many songs did you write did you why didn't you like i I totally relate to that 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 mindset of like being like uh uh, convinced that i'm productive productively manic yeah yeah, (laughs) i've still been living in that (laughs) Uh, it's like the term for it (laughs) yeah 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 it's it's interesting like and it's interesting with music because like there's this kind of like, as long as I'm working on the thing, it doesn't matter if I don't get anything done. I'm, at least I'm glad I, I, I spent six hours just working on it. You know, there's yeah. like this kind of like illusion that time isn't being um, dwindled away, but rather it's it's used in a productive um, state or productive which, flow. Which is really nice to make 
music a career because it gives me the opportunity to play guitar for five hours and right. then say, well, that was practice for the next live performance. <laughs> Or that that'll that new chord that I learned will sound great on this song or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. And that's the cool thing. Like once you learn, you have like a thing you can constantly be obsessed with weird niche things and pay it off yeah. later. Like ah, oh, you know, uh, Bjork uses nothing but tritones in the song. This is so sweet. What's that? And like now I want to try <laughs> something that you can never stop learning with. Right. Which is fun and so cool, and why so many people are like addicted to it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's like an endless... I agree with you, but I think everyone's got like a different like perspective of why it is. I think there's so many things that go into a song or a piece of art where if you were taking a visual art like painting, it's your paintbrush and your pencil and your paper. But if it's with a guitar, there's, you know, there's six strings that can unlock endless sounds endless right. endless emotions being expressed through those sounds different chord progressions different strumming patterns and when it's something like songwriting there's a million words that you can pick and choose from and so when the possibilities are so endless it, it you're never going to get bored of it right it's interesting it's like there's a limited that you know there's limited notes right and there's limited lang words in our language at one point but with even within like a handful of like okay you have t uh, 12 notes eight of them are going to kind of be accepted in this key um there's so much that can be done and so many other little things that factor and divine whole uh, define like whole cultures like yeah. a, a, a specific rhythm can be someone's whole like culture into some degree or, or a part of it, I should say, not a whole, you know. But, like, uh, it's it's fascinating how, like, little things could just a, a small amount of options could be a whole menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I greatly prefer playing a 12-string guitar over a 6-string guitar for that same reason. It just, it's a fuller sound and it gives, uh, obviously, but it also gives you six more chances to mess around with it. Definitely, all oh, that's mostly what uh, what my uh my band uses. Is I use a lot of twelve strings and open tunes mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but that's cool. That's cool. Um, so they kind of like uh kind of shift it back to like we went through some narrative here, <laughs> but that I find it fascinating that like um, even that this age, you know, I mean, like you're one. It, it's quite imp impressive what you're doing. Not a lot of people in their 30s or later or 40s or like i'm sure like even your your dad could uh, attest for it like write their own songs and commit to the bit and like because it, it takes a a certain amount of dedication to do to do that like it is the two percent it really is like the playing the your song for two minutes in front of people like that payoff has to be like that impactful which it sounds like it which it you describe it as being for yourself but like did you notice, like, at a younger age, like, other, and you said it now with, like, school, but has it always been that way with school? Were you always dedicated in, like, or not dedicated, um, uh, disciplined in what you do? Or did you notice, like, that kind of, like, came after, like, being musically engaged? I think the biggest thing for me is that I have to love what I do. Mm -hmm. And so in elementary school and I guess – elementary school was really the only time I wasn't playing guitar but when I was younger you know like school is is what you do like you you wake up and you go and and then you go home for the day and you hang out with like your parents when you're that young and I think I never felt like a passion for education or a passion for going to school until I started to pick up music because when I found out that there was something that I love to do and that I never got bored of or I never really got like so frustrated with and that I just wanted to like quit and I think when I discovered that was when I kind of I kind of almost 
stopped being as disciplined with school. And now I still, I mean, my first day of school is tomorrow. <laughs> so first day, of year. <laughs> but I think high school like has, has been a struggle because as much as I want to be as disciplined with my schoolwork as I am with my music, I just don't have a love for algebra and <laughs> yeah. bio as I have for going home every day and, and like playing music. No, it makes sense. It's just, it's interesting. Cause like a lot of, uh, there's a lot of payoff as far as like learning how to be disciplined musically, those, that skill set, like this constant, like self learning helps you in so many other aspects. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it's learning how to study like uh, trigonometry or or, or 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 World War II history, like the same like things you use to like kind of help yourself engage musically, those skill sets kind of pay off in both ends. And like it's interesting because like it's that like right now that you're trying to develop this thing, which is what I want to do out of school, which is a big thing for most people. And what's cool about your situation is you know what it is you know what yeah I mean? you know what you want to do now it's like how do you do it and there's no right or wrong way which is so frustrating <laughs> to hear it's super frustrating because i mean normally let's say somebody like doesn't know what they want to do well then you do the same thing as everybody else you graduate high school and you go into college and then right. you just say undecided instead of whatever specific major so I think especially in my specific area of Columbus with Hilliard and like those suburbs, there's a very big emphasis on you graduate high school and then you go to college. And from there, you can choose if you want to do your master's or if you want to start working. And then from there, you're living your adult life. You get married and you have kids. And that's the path that everybody around me has followed. That's the path that the kids my age want to follow and so to not be following that path there's almost a sense of rebellion with it right right it's what well, the kind of what i wanted to unplug uh, unpin from earlier is you said you were going to go to community college which is yeah. a super badass move like that is like as far as like doing music full-time and still kind of engaging in this because you seem to be very well aware of like the benefits of a higher education or just the continuation of education like which is i don't know maybe higher sounds like so like down putting anyone who's not college <laughs> yeah. you know I, mean, I don't i don't mean to put it like that but like um i think that's the way to do it it's so much more affordable and you meet and like it, it's cool like oh i gotta take a, a stats class whatever I'll get through it and you can like still focus on your thing and like it's it, you meet people along the way and like it's way more for and you're still knocking it out as opposed to going to like um oh you or whatever for like marketing and being like I hate doing accounting <laughs> like yeah yeah I know and I think I I don't think that I would learn as much about music in a university setting as I am doing it and traveling for music and meeting new people and and working in a studio and so instead of just being like well I'm there's nothing more for me to learn like I'm all good I think yeah. instead I'd rather focus getting that higher education on things that can further my career with marketing right no I think that's really smart and like I went to a I went to try C up here in um uh Cleveland and that, which is a community college, and then I went to Cleveland State eventually, but like n went there first to knock it out. And like it's it's comforting to know that hey, you can fail algebra again if you really you know need to. Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's not make or break the bank. And like, and like just like you said, there's like two, it's there's like two aspects of like music, and like I don't I don't think one's right or wrong. And like, but like there's the academic route, right? Like, and it sounds like you've had a fair amount of like a uh, experience doing that with like musicals and choir and then yeah. there's the street route kind of or like the the going out and the mic night route the performing the diy route let's call it that way the diy yeah. route and like that's a whole nother skill set and they don't necessarily overlap but knowing stuff on each end makes the the overlap happen and better like yeah was a bef were you playing guitar before um call it or before a choir or a or a um a theater 
I was, yeah. Okay. And I think with musical theater, I can I can pretty confidently say that it helped me a lot in my music, but it didn't help me at all in my career. Um, I think with musical theater, it was able to help me in, in knowing how to hit specific notes and knowing how to kind of structure my voice and strengthen my voice. But in terms of music where you have to figure out how to play gigs and how to get interviews and how to appear on this or how to how to do this or how to advertise this musical theater didn't really help at all right well i mean it's set up right you go there you do the bit and it's the people that are going to come are going to come for that like yeah yeah but i imagine also there's kind of like the, as far as like I didn't I didn't do anything like that in school, like I wish I did stuff like that. I did the I did the DIY route. I did what you're you're basically doing now. Like in in, in middle school through high school, I was going to bars and playing, playing sitting in with bands and like trying to sing and play in public and like do that whole bit. But like I didn't do the academic route, which is what I do now. I'm a teacher, <laughs> but I didn't do yeah. that for myself. Um, at least then and like but i can see like how like maybe theater skills like being able to like put it on like put on the face when maybe you're tired and like get in that headspace of like well it's a show you know what i mean i can see maybe yeah, some skill sets yeah. like that paying off i think i think music and acting even now in my career are are very closely knitted and very closely tied because musical theater definitely taught me how to, how to, a lot of, I, or I guess a lot about like showmanship. Yeah. And I think it's helped me a lot, especially doing longer gigs now, because I'm used to being on stage for three hours. And right. now it's just being on stage for three hours, but actually getting to be myself instead of a character. Okay. Yeah, that is a big difference. Like doing the acoustic gigs, like, so you're doing some bar gigs and stuff where they're like, yeah, you know, from eight to ten, like, yeah. Do you yeah. like those? I, I my my perfect set length for me is like one hour exactly. <laughs> I a hundred percent relate to that, and like that's why I ask because like uh, the four... an hour set is just like my favorite thing in the world. If somebody's like, come play from nine to ten or from eight to nine, I'll be like. I do not care what your venue is. I will do it. <laughs> right, right. Because if not, then you got to like, and depending where it is, if it's a bar, then like, you know, you start to become background noise. And that's part of the, that's part of the thing. Not everyone's there for, for the performance. They're there to be there. And like, it's a hard mindset yeah. to get in because you spend so long trying to like learn how to be entertaining. <laughs> like, um, yeah, yeah. Like how long did it take the, to get the three hours set together? I guess if you're doing 80 songs on the uke, it should be easy. Or you know what I mean, like. <laughs> um, I think building my way up was like the best thing that I kind of like figured out how to do. So I would start with like, you know, two or three songs at an open mic, and then from there I would play a thirty-minute set somewhere, and then from there I would play the hour, and I think figuring out. So what I did to kind of figure out what songs to play for a two or three hour long set was I would take my hour long set and then I would see the way I positioned it where it was like slower and then upbeat and then upbeat and then slower okay, kind of thing. Yeah. And I yeah, looked yeah. at my song and then I would find songs that kind of fit in with that. So I would just lengthen the amount of upbeat songs and then lengthen the amount of sadder songs. And so and then from there, if I saw that there were like too many sad songs, I would switch it around or whatever. So formulating a set list helped okay. me out a lot. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Make making the peaks and valleys of a, of um, of what the show is gonna be. And like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good strategy for it. What is success as far as what are you looking at for? How do how you how would you define success now? Like. You, we were kind of talking, uh, and you mentioned career and what you're focused on. If you had to define success as of now, what, what what's that look like? I think success for me looks like people 
not just knowing who I am or not just knowing my music, but knowing my lyrics and being able to relate to those. And to touch even one person is incredible, but I think success to me is being able to touch a million people with the way that I structure my songs and with the way that I write. And I think if if I can release songs that can fit every person's mood for whatever mood that they're in and to just know that there's somebody out there who has felt the same way that a stranger is feeling now would be the pinnacle of success. Okay. So being heard. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, sure. Well, in like, in like, I mean, you said it way, way more eloquently, but like, <laughs> but, uh, I think, well, I think that's what you're, you're doing a good job at that. <laughs> Definitely looks like you're making your way around and being heard. Like so, I think you're well on your way to being the well on on your way to reaching that success that you're looking for. What? Okay, let's do a let's do a, a Columbus plug hole right now. Who are the homies <laughs> musically that have supported you and like kind of maybe were the first that heard you? Um, Frankie Soleil for sure. Um, she was one of the original people that used to play at Katama. She's a couple years older than me. Um, and I think we, as, even though we weren't like close throughout all the years, we definitely got to see each other grow a lot with music. And I think that was really awesome. Um, Faye in Columbus is a really incredible artist and she's one of those people that I listen to her music and I'm like, holy shit, like that's, that's what I want to be doing. And so I think, um, I think there's a, a very strong community in Columbus of female musicians. And I think that's super cool to see as yeah. another young female musician. Right. Right. Well, the kind of like that, I think, well, to, I said I was going to not, or I was going to try to sell Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the have you played you haven't played in Cleveland, right? No, I haven't yet. Okay. Cleveland's got a super supportive music scene as far as like as at least as far as I'm concerned cuz I'm looking at it with rose tinted glasses like um when the whole pandemic happened there was a lot of benefit shows and people came out of the woodworks to keep the venues open, the people open, the uh the the morale up. I did a couple fundraisers for venues, and we've raised over a few thousand dollars for different for different venues and different um different ga art galleries and like a that's whole sort of yeah. But that that's only incredible because of the people here. And uh, I did a fundraiser for a student to get a service dog, and that was a nine thousand dollar dog. And oh my god! We made it basically in a week, and it was a week of streamed shows from other musicians reaching out and like. So when it comes to different scenes around, I I'd recommend this one because that's been my experience. And like I, uh, like I was saying, it might be rose tinted, but the people here, everyone's very supportive, and cares a lot. So that's my that's my sales pitch to Cleveland. You do what you need to do, but <laughs> but that's awesome. At the very least, I'll I'll play some shows there for sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and one more, let's do a plug hole for what you got. Like, what do you got? Um coming out i know there's the, uh, the album right september 9th i have a new song coming out okay september 9th um, coming up pretty quickly yeah um and actually after we record this interview i'll be like posting the cover for the first time uh, you heard <laughs> it here this will come out like probably a week or two later but <laughs> this is this is the pre or this is the pre uh pre behind yeah. the scenes inside baseball <laughs> And then I have an album coming out in October, which is super exciting. It's my first like project of like a bunch of songs put together. So I'm really excited for that. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, that's some stuff to look forward to. Any any shows other than the one in Cincinnati? Um, I don't have specific dates lined up quite yet. Okay. Um, but well, I'll shoot those your way when I get them. <laughs> okay. So with like that okay the aspect like the mindset of like using social media to help promote your like your music it was there ever like i mean the and it's a new thing right the these digital outlets of of ways to like express and share what you're working on um 
and and like and there's no right or wrong way to do it, right? There's all these different aspects, and different people are better at it. You can put more money into it, but like, is there like a? Do you feel like this helped more, or do you think it kind of like, as far as like digital and uh, social media platforms, do you think it helps amplify messages more, or do you think it kind of narrates and crafts different messages, like as far as like. If I had the chance to go back in time and be a musician without the age of social media, I would. Um, I think with social media, I still, like, I don't know, like, I still don't have TikTok. I still don't really use Reels. I still, like, don't really post, like, the traditional amount that I guess, like, I should. And I think it it takes away a lot of privacy. Right. I think it takes away a lot of authenticity and, and as much as I love social media for connecting, if I, if I had the chance to advertise my music solely through flyers and through my business card and and through press kits, et cetera, et cetera, I think I, I would take it. Okay. It's interesting because like I've talked a fair amount with like uh, female musicians and like different media has been maybe more like hurtful than than uh or maybe i shouldn't say female just with anyone uh different aspects of social media has been more detrimental as far as what they feel they can as- uh, artistically express uh as opposed to uh, uh like amplifying their signal and i just find it interesting like it's a it's a really a uh, kind of love hate thing like it works and it doesn't work but yeah uh, yeah i think that's uh, th- like what you said was quite wise and i think uh it you know maybe we'd be <laughs> all better at formatting things on paper <laughs> yeah um, what you're doing is awesome and i think you're you're going to be that taylor swift for so many more people than you think you're probably even aware of you know oh i mean you're going to be that figure and like <laughs> Just from like teaching kids your age and younger and seeing their friends and how they affect them in one room and to have someone like you, your age, doing what you're doing at the level that you're doing it and the the de- dedication that you're doing it, it's it's going to start so many fires <laughs> in a good way yeah. and um, yeah. just keep it up. That's super badass. And uh, thanks oh for chatting with me. Oh <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for hanging. Yeah, for sure. I'll see you.